text if we need to, uh, to, to let people know to keep praying for that individual. Thank you for being here today. In the course of the next hour or so, we're going to sing songs of praise to God to, to give Him the glory and the honor and the adoration that He is so, so deserving of. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we've got a few weeks left. I'm still trying to stay out of prison. So if you want to contribute to my bail fund, I would really, really appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. Brother Leo's got our opening prayer. And Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who never changed from age to age, or from season to season, your grace, love, forgiveness, and righteousness continue to guide us. We look forward to this time of worship as your church. Thank you for your many blessings to all of our different families. Grant peace and comfort to our sick and shut-ins and to those who are bereaved for past loved ones. Father, we are an imperfect people who continue to need your mercy, that we may pass it on to others. Again, thank you, Father, for this time with you. We focus on you now in our prayers and our hymns, and most of all, help us to be attuned in the sermon this morning to your word. May all of our service be a substitute to you. Amen.
a sense of what's really in our heart. And we're so grateful for just the ability to be able to use our hands and have it produce something. And Father, we ask that you help us and the ones who lead our family to know what it is that you wish for them to do with these and help those and guide them in the way that they need to be guided. And all these things we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
I have a lot to say, so I'm going to speak a little quickly, uh, but I don't want it to be a sermon. <laughs> I'll save that for Tim. So in a recent study, 63% of Americans say they were Christians, 41% admitted that they go once a month, 11% admitted that they read their Bible regularly, and less than 7% have read the books of Acts to its entirety. So the book of Acts is important, and I bring it up because it is the acts of what happened after Jesus died, the acts of the apostles, the acts of Saul to Paul, the acts of how must I be saved from Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 11, Acts 16, Acts 17, you get the point. So it gives us those answers, how they built the church as Jesus intended it to be built with the aid of the Holy Ghost, but it isn't just a sermon. It isn't just a recollection of what they did, but rather it's a book of hope. Everything in the Bible, as Peter says, for life and righteousness sake, everything in the Bible is meant to inspire hope, to inspire memory from the sacrifice of Jesus. This book shows us how Peter had his redemption arc. We looked at a, a different way of seeing Peter a couple of Sundays ago, and we saw how Peter can just be a one, one facet to many people, but he, he's a very, very complex person. And we see his redemption arc of when he answered Jesus' call to feed his sheep in the last part of John's gospel, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And we see how Peter became that rock, the foundation of the new church, but many will still not read it, so I will use Acts today and hope that if this is the only time that maybe one of you in this room hears the, the words from the book of Acts, that it may prick your heart. Acts 2, 14 through 47, now you know I'm speaking fast, 14 through 47. Then Peter stood with the eleven, he raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you, listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. God says he will pour my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire, billow of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of our Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So fellow Israelites, listen to this, Peter says. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan, God's foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him, this very supper. David said about him, I saw the Lord before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, and my body also will rest in hope. Because you will not be abandoned to the realm of the dead. You will not lead your Holy One to see decay. You will made known to me the paths of light. You will fill me with the joy of your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this very day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place on his descendants on his throne. Seeing what, has, what is to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, and he did not abandon in the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God had raised this Jesus to life, and we will all witness it, and we were all witness to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he received the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and poured out what you now see and hear, the many tongues that you hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at the right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Therefore, let all Israel be assured to this. God has made this Jesus, whom was crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut at the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And then Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every single one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And listen to this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings of Jesus and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and and gave to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple's courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their numbers daily, those who were being saved. Amen. Everything there was quintessential for our faith today. But let us focus on what we're here for at this moment, the Lord's Supper. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So the communion gave them some two things in that moment. To the outside observer, it might be odd, a theological attention. Yet to this day, we get the same things out of the supper. It invokes memory and provokes hope. Invoking the memory of the sacred church that Jesus died for, the theological word for this memory is animesis. Animesis is the deliberate recalling or retelling of God's savings acts of love, mercy, and grace, in this case for the church. And he willfully poured out his blood to be our savior, as Peter said. This do, this, or this do in remembrance of me, as Paul as Jesus said, and then Paul recollected to the Corinthians. It provokes hope. Not only is this a memory for the church to continue in various forms and frequencies and acts, but to practice communion, it is for the sake of hope. The early church broke bread, poured the cup, not simply to enact a memorial meal, but primarily as a, an act of hope to say this supper represents the very thing that keeps us going. The kingdom and his will is what those nail-scarred hands made possible. It was a foreknowledge, a, a plan in the beginning that at this table, that no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer man or female, for all are now in one with Christ, as Paul told the Galatians. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun will not strike them. No more scorching of heat. For the lamb is at the center of the throne, will be their shepherd, and will guide them to the springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, as John the Beloved said. This meal provokes hope. Peter didn't die on the cross upside down for Nero because he was hopeless. Andrew didn't die on an X-shaped cross and still preached the gospel as he was dying because he was hopeless. Philip didn't get hung in Turkey because he was hopeless. Bartholomew didn't get filleted in India because he was hopeless. Matthew died at the king of Ethiopia's bodyguard's hands because he was hopeless. Thomas didn't die from a spear in his chest and his body then didn't take into Edessy because he was hopeless. James, son of Alphys, clubbed or stoned to death because he was hopeless. Thaddeus or Jude died by a volley of arrows in the chest in Persia because he was hopeless. Simon the Zealot saw Jude died from those arrows and crucified by the Persians because he was hopeless. And John the Beloved, the last one, didn't die on that island because he was hopeless. Their convictions of the truth and dying for that hope should give us hope ourselves in a less but similar fashion as Jesus Christ himself. So let us, brethren, as those first Christians and apostles did in Acts, take this supper and provoke our memories and provoke in each other hope. Think of these things.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we now take time to gather around this table and partake of these emblems, which helps us to remember the sacrifice that Christ was willing to make for our sins. We're thankful for your grace and the forgiveness that we can receive for the things that we do wrong. We ask that you would bless this bread, which represents Christ's body that hung on that cross for our sins. We pray each of us would take it in a manner acceptable in your sight. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Father, that hope that we have is indeed the anchor of our soul. We pray, Lord, as we partake of this, that we will remember what Jesus, our Savior, did for us as he hung on that cross and bled for our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.
Good job, Lucius. Thank you. <clears throat> Most every one of us at some point in time has had someone we consider to be our, our hero. Uh, when you think of heroes, you might think of somebody who is brave and selfless and full of integrity. Uh, there's nothing ever too big. They save the day. They don't accept anything in exchange, and they just ride off into the sunset. What a hero. You might be thinking of Superman or Wonder Woman or Batman and Robin, and those are what we've termed superheroes. Or you may be thinking a little more realistic. Maybe you're thinking about your own mom or dad. Uh, maybe some great hero of faith to you that you grew up knowing and looking up to. You know, the Bible is full of heroes. I mean, when you think of heroes in the Bible, you, you think of Abraham and David and Moses and Peter. But when I think of Abraham and David and Moses and Peter, they don't quite fit that definition of, of hero. Uh, brave and selfless and full of integrity. When I think of Abraham, I think of a fellow who, who when he got challenged and was afraid, he, he lied about his wife. And he asked his wife to lie about herself being his sister. Uh, when I think of David, I think of somebody who had a hard time controlling himself, uh, controlling his pride, controlling his passions. When I think of Moses, I think of somebody who, who was making excuses and wanted to, to avert attention, wanted to stay out of the limelight, didn't want to serve God like God wanted him to serve. When I think of Peter, well... <laughs> We know Peter, he fulfilled the prophecy Jesus said that before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times, and he did. And he ran into the darkness scared. But you know, when I think of Abraham, I think of a fellow who in time grew and matured into the father of the faithful. When I think of David, I think of a man who, who grew and matured, and God said, he's a man after my own heart. When I think of Moses, I can see Moses standing face to face with Pharaoh and without fear but with faith in God says, let my people go. Which he could have lost his life right then. When I think of Peter, yeah, he denied Jesus and fled into the darkness. But I see him on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And as Logan referred to a few minutes ago, what we find out about Peter in Tradition is that he was crucified upside down. And, and I don't know how you see Peter being crucified upside down. Uh, I used to think it went kind of like this. Peter says, listen, guys, when you crucify me, I, I can't be crucified like my Savior. I'm not worthy. Crucify me upside down. And they were so nice and sweet. They said, okay. <laughs> that ain't so. It was ugly. It was harmful. It was hurt. It was painful. There, there was a lot that went into that. But it showed the faith that Peter had. Now, when I look at Abraham and David and Moses and Peter, I see folks who fell and failed and messed up. I see sinners. I see they had those things in common. But I also see that they had a great faith in God when you look at their overall life. That should make us feel good. Amen? If you've never failed God, please raise your hand. I need to get to know you better. I need to spend time with you. We've all failed God. We've all fallen. We've all messed up. But with faith in God, we can get up. I mean, that's the difference, isn't it, between Peter and, and Judas? They both denied or rejected Jesus. One denied, one uh, you know, betrayed, and, and we look and we weigh that out. It's the same. It's the same. But Judas gave up and Peter got up. Amen. And that's the difference. And it was because of faith in God that Peter could get up. It was because he believed in the one he followed and the one he served. In Hebrews chapter 11, we, we see a lot of heroes of faith. Uh, and a lot of these that we see in Hebrews 11, and I started to put a graphic up, but I didn't want anybody to get their feelings hurt. Uh, they could have fallen and not got up. And I started to put that up there, but I didn't. Okay? Because they did get up. They fell, but they got up. 
You know, just prior to chapter 11, however, just prior to chapter 11 is chapter 10. And in chapter 10, at the end of chapter 10, we have this, starting in verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous ones shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Right there in the middle of those verses. The righteous shall live by faith. How many of you heard that before? Everybody's heard that. The righteous shall live by faith. If you've been in Bible class, Sunday school, VBS, any amount of time at all, you've heard that. That was probably a memory verse when you were small. You've heard the preacher say, the righteous shall live by faith. The preacher say it because they're quoting somebody. Guess what? The Hebrew writer was quoting somebody. In fact, he was quoting Habakkuk when Habakkuk wrote that. He was quoting Habakkuk. And, and we're not told, we don't know for sure who the writer of Hebrews was. I personally think that Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews. And the reason I do is for several reasons, but here's one of them. He says, the righteous shall live by faith. He also says that in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and Galatians chapter 3, 11. The righteous shall live by faith, not talk by faith, not think by faith, not feel by faith. The righteous shall live by faith, not occupy a pew by faith, not put on a good front by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. They shall pitch their tent in faith. They shall abide. They shall exist. They shall live by faith in God. And I think that's so, un so important that we understand that because life is a, or faith rather, is a lifestyle. It's where we are. It's who we are. It's what we are. And I'm afraid that when we live by faith, until we live by faith, we'll never experience all God has to work in our life. Now just think about that for just a second. Until we put our faith in God, until we live by faith in God, we'll experience us. But when we put our faith in God, when we trust Him, when we live in faith, we can experience what God has to work in our lives. Now, if this is true, then it begs the question, what is faith? And how does it work? And I think that's a fair question for those who are coming to faith, those who are growing in their faith. I think it's fair a question for those who have been Christians for many, many years because until we meet Jesus Christ, we will be growing or shrinking back. And if we're shrinking back, He will have no pleasure in us. But if we're growing in our faith, it's fair to say that that is commendable. Her Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith in God is, is faith in Him. It's faith in who He says He is. It's faith in what He does. It's faith in how He handles situations. Now, somebody says, whoa, wait just a minute. You know, I don't always like the way God handles situations. Well, I don't either. But do you know that God is always right? Somebody say yes. Okay. So how he handles it, it may not be the way we would have preferred, but it's the way he handles it. And if he always gets it right, guess what? It's going to be okay. Because that's what faith in God leads us to not only feel, think, but to believe and to know. I, th I think it's important that we understand this. The value of your faith is not tied to how much faith you have. Okay? Jesus says, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed. Somebody show me how big a grain of mustard seed is. I can't see it. That's so small. Yeah, right. Exactly. You can't see it. But Jesus says, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains. You see, it's not the size of our faith. It's the substance. It's the assurance of our faith. It's what we put our faith in. That's why people who put their faith in astrology and, and the horoscope and the palm readers and, and to soothsayers and all this, that's why they're, 
disappointed time and time and time again because it just doesn't come out right. It just doesn't turn out like they wanted it to. It's not what they were hoping for and it's not what they get and now they're just lost and, and, and just beside themselves and, and they can walk around aimlessly living a meaningless life. But for Christians who put their faith in God, they put their faith in something that they can stand on. You know, today it's easy to put our faith in what we can see and feel and touch. Uh, it's easy to put our faith in our money. It's easy to put our faith in our possessions. It's easy to put our faith in, in who we are. And I, I don't know. I, I've seen TV shows where a cop pulls somebody over and says, Do you know who I am? As if. Okay? <clears throat> I heard about a fellow. He was a college student at David Lipscomb and he was parking cars at Ryman Auditorium, the Grand Ole Opry, and uh, he, he's charging, this is a long time ago, and he's charging like $5 a spot and he's parking cars at the Grand Ole Opry and the fella pulls in in a black Cadillac and, and he doesn't stop to give him $5, he just keeps going. Well, this friend of mine, he, he followed him to where he parked and when he got out, he said, sir, you owe me $5. He said, no, I don't pay. He said, yes, you do. He said, no, I, I don't pay. They don't make me pay. He says, yes, they do. He says, well, I'm not paying you five. About that time, his supervisor came up. He said, hey, 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 hey. He said, let him go. He says, why? He said, do you know who he is? He said, yeah, he's somebody's trying to part without paying his $5. And the fellow said, thank, thank you, he left, whatever. He said, you don't know who that is? He said, no, I don't care who it is. He owes $5. He said, that's Johnny Cash. He said, who's Johnny Cash? <laughs> All he knew was he was somebody owed him five dollars for parking. A lot of people want to live on, do you know who I am? You know what? Who you are, I used to say who you are in a quarter, but who you are in five dollars will get you a coffee now. And a lot of people still put their, their trust and their faith and, and the base of their life in who they are and what they have. Faith is the assurance, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> this, this big eye, little you mentality will only get you so far, but it won't get you past judgment with God. You know, it's, it, it's, it's easy to lose faith in God when things don't go right. How many of you have ever experienced something in life that was painful, sorrowful, or made you suffer somehow. Raise your hand. You know what Romans 8, 28 tells us? All things, that's not some things, most things, a lot of things, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That's exactly right. Now, I don't know how that always works, but I read it in God's Word, and God, God had that put in there. God had that written... So I know it's true. You know, the interesting thing is, I can look back on my life and when things hurt and when things fell apart and when things didn't go like I wanted to, somehow they worked out just fine. You know why? Because God said that's how it works. And when you put your faith in the assurance or the substance of God, the things hoped for, that's how things work out. The conviction of things not Seen. That's big. That's huge. This is faith. And this is a good photo op. If you want to take your phone and, and take a picture of this slide, that'd be a good idea. Or write it down if you want to. I found this this week. I think this is awesome. Faith is acting like it's so before it is so, so that it becomes so because God says so. That's what faith is. It's acting like it's so. You know what? It's not just acting Pollyanna and without thought or anything. It's just, 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 just walking blindly. Faith is acting like it's so. It's living like whatever God says is true. Before it's true, before you see it, so it'll become true in your life because God said it'll become true in your life. That's what faith is. Acting like it's so before it is so, so it becomes so because God says it's so. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. 
And when he talks about the people of old, let me, let me back it up for you. There you go. <clears throat> there you go. I'll do that. We'll put it on. Aaron, put that on Facebook. I'll get it for you. Uh, the people of old that we read about here are people in the Old Testament prior to the first century. Uh, and these people that we read of in the Old Testament, Abraham, David, Moses, uh, others that we read of, Jephthah, Barak, Samson, all these, they were people. They were just people. Like people sitting in these pews. Like you. Like me. They were just people who had to deal with trials and troubles, with, with difficult relationships, with difficult people, with difficult circumstances, with difficult expectations. They were people who sometimes had a financial crunch in their life. They were people who had to deal with people talking about them behind their back, making up stories about them. They were people who sinned. In fact, these people in the Old Testament were sinners. You know, the fact is there are some dirty, rotten sinners in this church building today. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, get your phone, pull your camera app up, and then turn the camera around backwards so it looks right at you and see who it is. Because it's every one of us. Somebody say amen. amen. You say, well, wait a minute, I'm not a dirty, rod sinner. Well, you know, Paul says you are. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. Later on, he says, for all, not most, many, some, all have sinned and come short of perfection, the glory of God. That's you and me, sinners. But I don't like the dirty, rotten part. I understand that. And you can compare yourself to somebody else and make you look really, really good. Or you can compare yourself to Jesus and see the dirty, rotten part. Thank you. That's what God tells us. I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. People in old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are told that they have got to disown Forget about God. They, they, they've got to do what they're told by the king and bow down to this, this, this monstrosity or they're going to be cast into the fiery furnace. You remember what they said? We won't do it because our God will deliver us. And we say, yeah, you go. That's the way to be. Do you remember what they said after that? Even if he doesn't. We won't do it because we have faith in God. Somehow, God will deliver us. He might not deliver us from the fire. He might deliver us through the fire, but He'll deliver us. When you read the Old Testament, there's all kinds of folks. Uh, Abraham is about to offer Isaac. He's at the bottom of the mountain. He tells the, the folks with him to stay where they are. He's going to take Isaac up on the mountain, just like God has told him, and offer Isaac there. Do you remember what Abraham told the guys there, he said, y'all hang out right here for a little while. He didn't say, I'll be back. He said, me and the lad will be back. Well, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to offer Isaac? I am. Aren't you supposed to offer him to God as a sacrifice? I am. Aren't you carrying the fire and the knife and everything you need for that sacrifice? I am. Then how are you and Isaac coming back? I don't know. I have no clue. But God has promised me, through Isaac, great blessings for the whole world. And I'm going to trust him to work that out. And you know how Abraham went up on the mountain and he offered Isaac, but before he took his life, he was stopped? You know who came down the mountain? Abraham and Isaac. And you know, if we weren't us, we'd be clapping right now because that is awesome. Amen? Amen? How awesome is that? We're coming back. We got faith in God. Abraham had this huge, huge faith in God. Habakkuk in, in, in chapter 3, he says, There's no fig on the tree. There's no cattle in the stall. That's an overall picture of how ugly things are. He says, There's nothing to eat. But God will take care of me. He always has, and He always will. You know, this list in Hebrews chapter 11, when you read through that list, 
It's a list of unlikely heroes. And when I read that list of unlikely heroes, I can't just see heroes of faith from the Old Testament. I can see people I've known my whole life in that list. They've sinned, they've messed up, they've done wrong. But when you look at their life, it's a life of faith in God. They followed God. They didn't give up. They got up. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made of things that are visible. I think the writer here is saying, to make my point, let's go back to the very beginning. Someone you can't see took something you don't see and made something you do see. Think about that for some. Someone you don't see, we can't see God. Amen? Someone you can't see took something you don't see and made everything we do see and will see and are going to see. Now, I say that because uh, he says uh, he formed the universe. Our, our strongest telescopes, they're, they're looking out there and they're improving those telescope and the optics so that they can see further and, and stronger and better. And they're discovering planets and galaxies and things that you and I will never see with the naked eye. You know who created those things? Somebody tell me. God. He created the universe. It was formed at His command. It was formed at His word. Now, Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen yet. Somehow, a, a really, really, really big, awesome God can show us what He created. And the longer we've lived, the more we've seen the creation of God. So, so why does God show us all this? Why does God show us the, the planets and the stars and the sun and the moon and the galaxies? Why does God show us these neat little fish that have headlights coming out the top of their head? Why does He show us these animals that we study and study and study and finally figure out why they have the appendages they do? Why does He show us these things? Because He can. And because only He can create them and show them to you. That's the God that we serve. That's the God we need to put our faith in. Amen? He can take something you don't see, make something you will see, make something you're going to see. He'll make you. Folks, that's the kind of God we need our faith in. He can do anything. Now, tell me how big your problem is that he don't know about. Tell me what it is that you're dealing with that he can't handle. Because if he can do what I read in Genesis 1, if he can do what I read in Hebrews 11, he can handle anything that I have. And he does it, and I love this, he does it with a word, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, 1 verse 3, and God said, let there be light, verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse, and verse 9, and God said, uh, verse 11, and God said, uh, verse 14, and God said, verse 20, God said, Verse 24, God said. Verse 25, God said. He didn't go to the workshop and start working on it. He just said it. By simple word, it happened. It was created because God said it. Someone you can't see takes something you don't see and creates everything you do see. There is nothing we have that is too big for God. Now I threw this up here. You know, it takes a lot of college. It takes a lot of education. It takes a lot of intellectualism. It takes a lot of philosophy to believe that you and I came from this primordial soup where proteins floated around and somehow created a single cell amoeba and it started increasing until it was a small 
wormy figure and, and it kept working till it became a fish and it kept swimming and jumping out until it became a bird and it kept flying down and hitting the ground and flying off and hitting the ground and flying off until it became a mammal that walked on the ground and, and then it became an upright mammal that looked somewhat like a chimp and then it evolved into something that looked like a gorilla and then it evolved into a man. Anybody believe that? It takes intellectualism. It takes college to believe garbage like this. You can ask a child who created the world and they'll tell you God created the world. God created, because God can and only God can. I, I found something else this last week I wanted to share with you. Once I was an amoeba beginning to begin. Then I was a tadpole with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey hanging from a tree. Now I'm a doctor with a PhD. <laughs> You've got to have a PhD or something like that to believe this garbage. This is baloney. This is malarkey. The, 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 there's a Greek word for rubbish. That's what this is. It's rubbish. I will have to admit I have met some people. I've observed some people. I've listened to some people that make me think maybe there is a missing link. But because I know God and trust God, I don't believe any of this. It's just not so. Our faith is only as strong as what we plant our faith in. It's not how much you have. It's what you put your faith in. And faith in God will carry you longer than faith in anything else. In fact, faith in God will carry us eternally. Somebody say amen. amen. That's just the way it is. Maybe this morning your faith in God is weak and you want to be stronger. Maybe this morning you have faith in everything but God. And, and faith in God is an elusive thing. It's, it's easy to place our faith in God when things are going good for us. It's easy to place faith in God or at least talk about faith in God as a, a cliche. I have faith in God when I have anything and everything I want because God has blessed me. It's easy to play the game. It's easy to look the part. It's totally different to put faith in God in your heart. And here again, faith is only faith if it has feet. We don't measure faith by feelings. We don't measure faith by thoughts. We measure faith by feet because we walk by faith. We don't feel by faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. Maybe that's where you want to be. Maybe you want to live by faith. You want to walk by faith. You want to live by faith. But you're not there yet. If you need us to pray, we'd love to pray for you. And I can guarantee you that some of us who will be praying for you are praying for ourselves at the same time to increase our own faith in God and our trust in Him. Maybe you've been reading you'd like to become a child of God. Maybe you've been reading and you want to become a follower of His. Maybe you've already made that decision. You want to be a child of God. And you want to be baptized into Jesus Christ. We'll do that today. We would be more than happy to do that today. Maybe you want to study a little bit more. And make sure. We'd love to study with you. Maybe there's something in your life that you've tried to get rid of. You've worked and worked and worked at it. And it hasn't gone yet. It's still very, very much a part of you. And you can't shake it. And you need prayer. You need help. If we can pray for you, if we can help you, whatever we can do today, won't you let us know? We'd love to as we stand and as we sing.
Christ in Christ.